as economies have grown, so have the people of Latin America. Since 1980, obesity has tripled in Mexico and rates are quickly rising in Argentina, Brazil and other countries in the region. Eating is now more affordable than ever, but it's leading to very expensive health problems. An alarming half of all Colombians are overweight. America's now contributing correspondent Michelle Begay takes a closer look at their struggle to stay slim and how Colombia's government is hoping to tip the scales in the other direction. When most people around the world hear of Colombian women, two international stars come to mind. The beautiful and voluptuous TV star Sofia Vergara and the international singer Shakira, whose hips don't lie. They are both the image of beauty and from the outside a picture of health. Not too skinny compared to most movie stars and fit. But the reality in their home country, Colombia, is much different. One out of every two Colombians is overweight or suffering from obesity. And the statistics, say doctors, show a bleak future. From 2005 to 2010, there was an increase in Colombian obesity of 5%. We were at 47%, and five years later, we are at a 52% obesity rate in the Colombian population. Dr. Ivan Darío Escobar Duque is president of the Colombian Foundation for Obesity. Her waistline is 121 centimeters, so at this moment she is exposed to metabolic illnesses, for example, diabetes, hypertension, and in the future a chance of cardiac illness such as a heart attack. Not so much because of the excess weight, but because of the intra-abdominal excess fat, which exposes you to more illness. 30-year-old Ana Paola Cruz was once a dancer that weighed only 48 kilos, or about 105 pounds. When I started working and leading a sedentary life, if there was a chocolate in front of me, I ate it. I also ate hamburgers, drank soda, and started to neglect myself. After two children, Ana Paola Cruz says it was hard to lose the baby weight, which only brought on more neglect. Today, she works as a receptionist at Dr. Escobar's office, and after seeing many patients come and go, she too wants to start treatment. Her doctor says it has to begin with nutrition. Our daily diets have changed a lot. Fast foods, people also look in the supermarkets for frozen meals to make them faster at home. And generally, these foods are higher in calories with excess carbohydrates and fat. Fast food culture has been growing steadily in Colombia. In 1995, there were only 10 different fast food chains. Now Colombia has a wide selection of economic fast foods, like McDonald's and Gino's Pizza, not to mention local franchises like Cali Mio and hamburger joints like Presto or El Corral. According to a business website, losdatos.com, 45 fast food restaurants reported an increase in sales of 25 percent from 2010 to 2011. Fabian Garcia, vice president of a consumer knowledge group called Radar, says the average Colombian family is no longer spending 26 percent of their income on buying food at the supermarket. Slowly, we are replacing our previous consumption of supermarket goods with foods outside our home. Why? Because it makes our lives easier, because more and more there is a better offer. Ten years ago, I was used to just seeing hamburgers or pizzas. Now I see not only a wider range of pizzas or hamburgers, but I also see gourmet food. And that satisfies me as a consumer. And I now also have the capability to purchase these goods. While on the streets of Bogota, you can see a lot of food chains from the United States. Studies show fast food from Colombia and other countries like Spain and Chile are just as competitive. Many Latin companies are generating a market of food chains here in Colombia. They are expanding their brands and chains, and not just in the four main cities, Bogota, Cali, Medellin, and Barranquilla, but they are also expanding through the next 13 main cities and cities in between. But nutritionist Lucia Correa de Ruiz says, don't be too quick to judge the burger you order. It's what's on the side that you should be more careful of. 
es ese tipo de comida? What foods am I eating, but more so how am I eating them? I can eat one of these meals, but I should limit the sauces and the side dishes. And now we generally see they always offer to make the portions bigger. But what of the traditional Colombian meals? Fried foods like empanadas have always been in the Colombian diet. Or the regional meals like this famous bandeja paisa. This meal is typical of the Antioquia region, where the city of Medellin is located. This plate has about 2,500 calories, which is the average recommended caloric intake for a man in one day, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But it's hard to say no to the fried pork on the side. Dr. Correa says individually, the foods on this plate are of good nutritional value. The key is to only have them occasionally. I always recommend the following. If you have your bandeja paisa at lunch, reduce the amount of foods that contain a lot of fat, like the pork crackling. But Colombian's food intake is just the beginning. A life with little exercise is what has one out of every five children in Colombia suffering from obesity. But for most Colombians, the statistics of obesity in the country may come as a shock. As you walk down most streets, these weight problems are not easy to detect. Dr. Escobar Duque says this is because obesity isn't the same in all places or ethnicities. Latin Americans live in a specific context. We have a problem in our countries with nutrition, specifically the malnutrition that we have had. A woman that gives birth to a child malnourished or who is born with a low weight, that child has the potential to be more diabetic or obese in the future. But a child who was born in the United States, on average, has a normal weight or a high birth weight. And in the future, even if he becomes obese, he won't have as many metabolic problems like the child born malnourished in Latin America. In 2009, Colombia passed the law number 1355 that defines obesity as a chronic illness of public health. But three years later, the law has yet to become public policy, and doctors have made an urgent call for its direct implementation. In these past three years, the Ministry of Health and Education, as well as various local government organizations, have been working on different articles of this law. And, really, there is a lot of activity on the topic of obesity. But like everything, there is still a lot left to do with that law. It needs to be fully implemented. As fast foods continue to gain popularity and technology brings children indoors, it can only be assumed that weight issues are going to continue and public policy will have to step up if it wants to make a difference. Over the last several years, reports from the World Health Organization show that half a billion people are considered obese and the highest obesity levels are in the region of the Americas. Recent figures show countries like Mexico, Venezuela, and Guatemala to be among the top 10 countries with obesity rates over 30% of the population. Laura Carlson is America's now contributing commentator in Mexico, and she has written extensively on this issue. She joins us here in our studios in Washington, D.C. Laura, welcome. Thank you, Elaine. Well, can you please tell us what are the reasons for such the drastic increment in the weight of an entire region in just a few decades? It is amazing. It can be summed up by saying it's the globalization of fat. What this means is that there are global trends that include changes in diet and lifestyle that have profoundly affected these countries. These have to do with the types of foods that people are eating. With free trade, a lot of processed foods and what's called the Western diet, high in saturated fats, high in sugar, processed foods, have come into these countries, and instead of eating fresh local foods, they're beginning to eat the potato chips and the processed foods that are coming through there. Then when you put that together with a change in lifestyles where children especially, and that's where we've really seen a change, are spending far more hours in front of television sets, playing video games, instead of outside playing or working, then you have a sedentary lifestyle, a change in diet, and a huge rise in obesity. Well, you mentioned free trade. You know, obviously, junk food, processed meals, and soft drinks are just some of the fairly obvious culprits in obesity. But other than free trade, what are some of the less obvious culprits? Well, first of all, there's media. 
because children are watching TV and they're seeing the change of diet reflected in the TV shows they watch and of course in the advertisements. So that's played a big role. And then there's the problem of what kinds of foods do people have access to? Because even in small communities with free trade, a lot of the land where food was produced in Mexico is a good example, is now been turned over to other activities that can be exported and make money. So that land where people produce basic foods are now being produced foods for export and for mining and for other types of activities. That means that when they go to their local stores or markets, they're not finding the fresh foods that they need. If free trade agreements in some countries do add to this, what is happening in Venezuela where there is no free trade? Well, you still have, of course, the sale of processed foods because there's a small number of food companies that control global markets. But then you also have the change in cultures, the kinds of things that I mentioned where people are being encouraged to eat the types of foods that are not healthy for them. And you also have a governments in most countries that are no longer taking an active role as in the health of their countries. Well, you just mentioned the government. What can local governments do to reverse some of these trends? It sounds like they're taking a sort of a back seat, but what can they do to be more proactive? Well, they are taking a back seat, and yet they recognize that it's a very serious problem. In Mexico, they're calculating that it could cost the government $12 billion in the next 10 years. And health problems like diabetes that are a direct result of obesity are very expensive, and they affect the population in an extremely negative way. But there are things that they can do. One of the things is to encourage small farmers to give them the kind of support they need to continue to produce basic fruit, foods. And the other is to limit what children have access to, especially in public spaces. Like, for example, banning junk food in schools. It's a very simple measure, and it could have a huge impact on the diet of children. A lot of companies seem to be taking advantage of all of this uh, with the diet pills, the fad diets. Um, is there an obesity industrial complex with all of this? Yeah, I don't know if you could call it that exactly, but there's certainly a lot of people taking advantage both of the ability to sell low nutrition, high fat, high sugar foods to a population, and then to deal with the health problems that result from it. So you have this vicious cycle that unfortunately is generating huge amounts of profits on both ends, on the problems end and on the consumption end. That means that there is not incentives for people to change and to break this vicious cycle. And that's one of the biggest problems that we've had. We're talking about an industry that's highly monopolized by just a few companies in the production of food from the ground up, literally from the ground to consumption. And they are controlling people's needs, people's wants, and the markets, and have no incentive to change that because the more they process the food, the more money they make. And then on the other hand, you do have, as you mentioned, these industries that are making a lot of money about dealing with the problems that are caused by our poor diets. So unless we can step in and say this is a crisis situation, governments and individuals and families, of course, in education, have to do something now, we could see this problem go from bad to worse. Laura Carlson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Elaine.